while I'm talking, I'm going to show some pictures, um, initially some 20 pictures that will just rotate behind me every minute and a half, roughly. The first group are about places of memory, which is what this book is kind of structured about. I'll be talking mainly about ideas, but the first pictures will show places of memory in, a, in a Hunan County. And the second group of photos will show some of the people involved in the book, and I may later flip back and forth. The, um, the first question a lot of people have is, what do I mean by underground historians? Are they hiding in a bunker or in the cellar? Um, and that's not really the case. But I was looking for a term that would capture what in Chinese is Minjian uh, leisure, so unofficial history, unofficial historians, uh, and that would have been one way to, to 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 call them. Underground historians sounds better in a subtitle, maybe, but it also um, it also captures this asymmetrical battle that they have with the state, which has many more resources. I also wanted to avoid the term dissidents, because a lot of the people, most of the people I write about are not really dissidents in the classic sense of the word. I don't know what, what you think of when you hear the word dissident, but it's often somebody on the margins of society, maybe um, who is being severely persecuted, et cetera, et cetera, and, and often who has a political program for opposing the government. The people I write about some of them have a political agenda. It's a, it's a continuum, a spectrum of, of different kinds of people, of course. But most of them have a much vaguer idea that they want to restore and tell all of the history over the past 75 years, including that which has been whitewashed. So they're not, they don't, most of them don't really have some kind of a, a program to replace the CCP with somebody else. In fact, I think if you talk to most people, they wouldn't know where to begin with that kind of conversation, like who could replace the Communist Party. It's just not even on most people's radar screen, that, that question. So they, and are they historians? You know, some people, especially at a university, maybe somebody's here studying history or from the history department, and they wonder, are they qualified historians? Are they, uh, do they have PhDs in history? And some of them do. Uh, some of them are from academia, and they have the standard uh, qualifications to be called a historian. A lot of them are not, however. A lot of them are autodidactic. They encountered something in their life and decided that they would have to explore it more fully. Some event, for some people of a certain generation, it might have been their experiences in the anti-rightist campaign, which was a big political campaign in the 1950s that persecuted most of China's intelligentsia. Uh, other people might have encountered the Cultural Revolution uh, from 1966 to 76, maybe just as teenagers. Others encountered maybe Tiananmen, or more recently, and I'll get to that maybe a little bit later, uh, the COVID lockdowns, which many people in China thought of as uh, not a bad policy, certainly at the beginning, but later, which many thought of as, as quite problematic and covering, cover, causing a lot of unnecessary suffering. And so they began to investigate that. And these people are not, uh, as I said, they're not dissidents in the sense that most of them have one foot inside the system. They're not totally on the outside. They own property. They, most of them have jobs. They raise families. They do these other quote unquote normal things that a lot of people do in different societies. But I guess all of them, it's probably fair to say, depending on how far they pursue their vocation or their calling, they are m marginalized in some way. They are professors who don't get promotion, tenure, housing, which in Chinese cities is, is quite a difficult thing if you don't get any housing. Um, they might be editors who also are kept on the edge of their publications, the margins of their publications. They're people for whom this is almost like a, as I said, a calling, a sacred calling. And I think this goes back to something that uh, gets to their motivations. Why do they pursue this? I get, one way to look at it is that it is so important to the Communist Party history. As Clay said, it's important in every country. 
uh, history in this country and in Europe and ev everywhere you go, especially maybe, especially over the past 50, 60 years, there's been a boom in history and popular history and oral history. All of these things have become much more present in our lives than uh, before, even maybe 100 years ago, when uh, history was just written by academics um, and, and was, didn't really concern most ordinary people. Now everybody seems to have a stake in history. In China, though, I would argue it's more important due to a couple of reasons. But the primary reason is that for the Communist Party, history is their main pillar of legitimacy. According to the party's telling, history brought the party to power. This is actually, in their own words, they say that. History brought the party to power. Essentially, the history designated the party as China's savior that in the middle of the 19th century, China was laid low by foreign powers. You think the Opium Wars, and that ensued a, a, sen a century of humiliation. And it was only in 1949, despite the efforts of well-meaning but sort of misguided patriots in the 19th century and the early 20th century, it was only in 1949 that the party was able to save China, restore China's territorial integrity, kick out the foreign occupiers, fight the United States to a standstill in the Korean War and put China on the path to prosperity. And like many national myths, there's a, a great deal of truth in this, in the sense that it did restore China's territorial integrity. And China is a much more prosperous place today than it was 75 years ago. Next year will be the 75th anniversary of the PRC. So, but, but the corollary of that story is that the party deserves to rule China into the future indefinitely because it has done such a good job in running the country. This is something that political scientists sometimes call performance legitimacy. We've done such a good job, we want to keep going. It's like the same argument that Biden will make next year when he runs for re-election, assuming he makes it that long to run for re-election. Anyways, that's another issue. We'll talk about another dysfunctional country next time, but we'll just stay on China. Um, but uh, in order to make this argument, you have to, the party has to kind of show that its rule has been relatively unblemished. That the past 75 years, despite a few hiccups here and there, the Great Famine, the Cultural Revolution, that overall its rule has been pretty good. In fact, excellent and that only the party can run China. This is what the counter historians object to. They object to what amounts to a whitewashing of many aspects of Chinese history. Again, not all of the past 75 years, they're not arguing that all the past 75 years have been bad, but they, they wanna point out the bad points in that past 75 years. Things that often affected them personally, but which they feel a calling or a duty to, to talk about. When I ask people what their motivation was, and it's interesting, the people I talk to, none of them speak English. None of them have studied abroad. They're not trained at excellent schools like USC or elsewhere. Um, they're motivated by ideals from Chinese culture, especially one idea that comes up over and over again is the concept of yi, of righteousness, or zheng yi, justice. That idea comes up over and over again. They saw something wrong, and for whatever reason, their genetic, their DNA doesn't allow them to keep silent. They just have to say something, and they feel it's their duty to document it. I think there's people like this in every culture on, on Earth. They're just people who are just made like that. You know, they have to kind of say something, they have to stand up and, and be counted, and they have to try to record it and document it. I think they're also motivated by the great stories of Chinese culture that in throughout Chinese history, there have been many historians or officials or poets and writers who stood up to injustice and who were banished, exiled to the far reaches of the empire, but who in the end were the heroes of the story. So if you think of China's first great historian, Sima Qian, somebody who comes up over and over again in discussions, he was persecuted by the emperor, in fact, even castrated, um, and persevered in writing the first great sort of macro history, or at least the extent most commonly regarded the first big history of China, because it was sort of his duty. And they think of even people like, say, the poet Su Dongpo, also for criticizing the imperial rule, was banished and, and wrote about it in his poetry. 
um, and, and, and so on and so forth. If you think of the, the Dragon Boat Festival, which is one of the big holidays in China, ultimately at heart, it's a story of dissent. It's a story of somebody who criticized the, the king for not pursuing rational policies or good policies and sold out his country and caused his country to be um, destroyed by, by a neighboring country, so neighboring kingdom. So, and then committed suicide. And that's why you have the Dragon Boat Festival to try to go find his body or prevent the fish from eating his body, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the stories that they feel motivated by, that history was so important. Um, the, uh, and in dynastic China, in imperial China, and obviously this is a huge swath of history and it's kind of insane to generalize about 2,000 years, but it is largely true that one dynasty wrote the previous dynasty's history. So you have the Qing dynasty writing the Ming history. And the usual template is the last dynasty did a pretty good job. It had its glory days, its heydays, it had its achievements, but then it fell down and we had to replace it. We were called by heaven. We assumed the mandate of heaven to run the country because only because the other dynasty was corrupt for whatever reason. The emperor was spending too much time with concubines or eunuchs started running the place and weren't listening to Confucian officials, whatever the story might be. The CCP likewise tells a similar story, that it had to replace the corrupt, incapable nationalist party, the KMT, because it was incompetent, and therefore that's why it runs the country. This has been the story from the beginning of the PRC. History has been extremely important in legitimizing party rule, even before the party took power in 1949, Mao, the sort of founding father of the PRC passed a resolution on history that Clay had just alluded to. These resolutions sound super boring. Somebody passes a resolution, big deal, doesn't really mean anything. But if you think of China as a country where there are laws and rules and regulations, but the party often rules through something called documentary politics. They issue documents that are sent down from the center to the provinces, to the cities, the counties, the villages, and they are templates or blueprints for how a certain key issue should be handled. So Mao, in his 1945 resolution, was explaining why he took control of the party and why that was a historical necessity, that the party was heading to defeat and destruction until he grabbed control in Yan'an and led the party from strength to strength. When he died, and after the debacles, I think it was fair to say, of the Mao era, the famine, the Cultural Revolution, et cetera, Deng Xiaoping took power, and in 1989 passed his own historical resolution, essentially explaining, well, there were all these problems in the Mao era, but still, the party is, number one, we got a rule, and now this is why I'm running the place. And so too, in 2021, 40 years later, Xi Jinping passed his own resolution. The resolution was so only the third one in the party's 100-year history. And this resolution ex essentially explained why there's a new era in Chinese politics, which is sort of a euphemism for no more term limits and one person being able, in other words, Xi Jinping being able to rule as long as he wants. Because there were good things in the reform era, but there were systemic chronic problems like corruption and only this new form of very much more centralized control could save the country. And that's essentially the message from the third resolution. So these resolutions are really important. And I think for Xi Jinping, it's been especially important. In 2012, when he took power, his first public appearance was at the National History Museum on Tiananmen Square. And there, there is a, a permanent exhibition called The Road to Rejuvenation. And The Road to Rejuvenation tells this mythic story about how China was laid low, there were these various people and efforts in the 19th century, and the party then saved China and led it from strength to strength. The Great Famine, in which an estimated 45 million people died, is not mentioned, and the Cultural Revolution gets one photo. And that's it. The rest of the, this rather large exhibition is, is uh, sent, you know, is given over to successes. It's a success story. So he made his first public appearance there. The next year, he essentially outlawed criticism of the Mao era. And before that, there had been a bit of criticism of the Mao era. There had been journalists like Yang Zhisheng, who had gotten access to archives in the 1990s and 2000s, and was able to prove the number of people who died in the Great Famine. 
So this kind of thing was no longer tolerated. He said he had this uh, phrase called the two negations. You cannot negate the Mao era and before the reform era. And you can't, or if you're a Maoist, you can't negate the reform era and be in favor of the Mao era. The two were part of the same history. You had to accept it all. And so therefore, criticism of the Mao era was now essentially off limits. And this is something that Deng Xiaoping had understood in 1981. Back in 1981, Mao, for many officials, was quite unpopular. The Great Famine was just 20 years in the past. Many people had a very vivid memory of that. And Deng kept Mao as, a, as, as the top sort of sacred leader because he realized that if you get rid of Mao, you get rid of all the basis of legitimacy for the party. So when Khrushchev tried to de-Stalinize in the Soviet Union, he could try to he could get rid of Stalin because he knew he had Lenin as the founding father who was untouchable. That was not possible in the post-cultural revolution era. And likewise, Xi Jinping was re-emphasizing that, saying this is this stuff that's been creeping up in the late 1990s and 2000s, no more of that. We're stopping that. So uh, that culminated, and, and I think a very significant act of filial unpiety in impiety, impiety, I guess, in 2016 when he closed a popular history journal called China Through the Ages, which is one translation of Yan Huang Chunxiu. So Yan Huang Chunxiu, or China Through the Ages, was started by a faction in the party after the Cultural Revolution, a faction that had suffered in the Mao era, did not want to get rid of the Communist Party. These were all loyal communists, but they felt that the, the dark chapters of the party's history had to still be dealt with, that it was only possible to go forward when you kind of had a clean slate. You know, you've admitted this, you've made amends, you've rehabilitated people as much as possible, and you can move forward. So they started this journal, and it was the most important alternative history journal in China, especially because it was a paper journal that you could subscribe to at the post office and they'd mail it to you and it was widely circulated around China. It was endorsed by Xi Jinping's own father who had given calligraphy to the, uh, to the magazine. This is something that Chinese leaders do. They tend to torture the population by writing calligraphy all the time. And then you go to some university and it's like got Jiang Zemin's you know, calligraphy, Jiao Tong, Dash, or something like that. And then they feel obliged to carve it in stone or something like that. Um, anyway, uh, so Xi Zhongshun, I don't think he's a noted calligrapher, but it doesn't really matter. They didn't carve it in stone. He wrote a, a piece of calligraphy that said, Yan Huang Shun Shou Ban Da Hao. It's like, it's, it's doing a good job. Um, so he, that was a sign that he supported that. And why, for example, and I have a chapter on the Mao, on the Xi family. And it's, uh, it's interesting. I think Xi Jinping saw firsthand the power of history. It's just that he, took, he drew a different conclusion than his father. His father had been a senior official in the Communist Party in 1949 when it took power. He was, I don't know, it's hard to judge these things, maybe one of the top 20, 30 people in the party. He had a very important, several very important jobs. And then he got to uh, toppled, uh, purged, because of a historic novel, of all things. It might kind of seem ridiculous, a historic novel, but there was a, a novelist who wanted to write a story about her father-in-law, in fact, who had been this legendary figure in northwestern China, in like, I think, um, um, What's his name? Uh, Teddy White. Was that? No, Edgar Snow. Edgar Snow called him the Robin Hood of the Communist Party. He robbed from the rich, gave to the poor, or something like that. He had a bandit of merry men who traipsed around northwestern China. So she wanted to write a, a novel about him, a long historical novel, and said, Xi Zhongshun, could, would you give me some interviews? Because you were his close associate. And Xi Zhongshun said, no, 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 this is too sensitive, too sensitive. And all of his friends began to just put pressure on him and say, come on, how it's... He's already been lionized. He's been, Mao said he was a good guy. So it can't be sensitive. He gave an interview. The, the novel came out in 1962, and uh, Mao took it as a personal affront that this guy was being lionized when Mao should have been numero uno from that period. He then launched a purge, and it sounds ridiculous, like, okay, but it was 20,000 people who were purged at that time in 1962. So it was a full-blown purge. Xi Zhongshun was sidelined. Uh, and then in the Cultural Revolution, suffered quite a lot. His, one of his daughters committed suicide, and his son, Xi Jinping, was sent off to the countryside to labor and do various other things. So I think Xi Zhongshun's lesson was, we need to address the past. We have to look into these kinds of things and try to 
prevent it from happening again, prevent these abuses of power which come from one man, strong man rule, like Mao Zedong. Uh, Xi Jinping took another lesson, which was that you have to keep part, party history very tightly under control. So I think there's this maybe Freudian analysis that I've just given. Another analysis is um, not that just that daddy was wrong, but it was a different lesson from the fall of the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1990, the people in charge of the party back then, especially around Deng Xiaoping, thought the key lesson of that was that the Soviet Union had not delivered enough consumer goods to the population. The economy was in the, was a, was in the pits. Uh, there, were, you know, there were bread lines, there were vodka lines, there were automobile lines, there was every kind of problem imaginable economically in the Soviet Union. And so they, in, in 1991, after conservatives had sort of taken back and slowed down control over economic reforms after Tiananmen Square, uh, Deng Xiaoping kick-started reforms again. Xi Jinping took another lesson, and he said this in several speeches. He said the Soviet Union, the main reason for the Soviet Union collapsing, I don't mean he completely rejects economic reforms or, or rejects the economic argument, but his argument is the key thing was ideology. The Soviet Union collapsed because people didn't believe in it anymore. They didn't believe in the mission of the Soviet Union. What was the Soviet Union for? Was it just an authoritarian extension of the Russian Empire, controlling Central Asia and stuff like that? Wasn't there sort of a, a deeper calling? We're supposed to be moving to socialism, to communism? And he blamed Gorbachev. Gorbachev is the bad guy in this story. The Gorbachev introduced Glasnost, and this led to people questioning all of the the history of the Soviet Union. There were groups like Memorial, which later won a Nobel Peace Prize for uncovering the crimes of the Stalin era, exhuming mass graves, etc. And he said, there'll be nothing, none of that on my watch. And he's, one of his, the telling phrase at the end of this was, was, talking about the Soviet Union, he said, at the end of it all, no one was man enough to just stop it. You know, and he's gonna be man enough, he's gonna get in here and stop this. So the question is, Stop what? What was he worried about? And I would argue that he was worried about this counter-history movement, which had begun in the late 1990s. Now you may say, why would he be worried about that? Maybe this is just a personal hobby of his or something like that, or just a personal infatuation or neuroses or something like that. I think that it's important to remember that even authoritarian leaders have limited political capital. They can only do so many things. They can only get the bureaucracy revved up to do a certain number of things. They can't just like go everything they want to do in China. This is sort of a misconception that they're godlike leaders. They pick and choose their fights very carefully. One of his fights right from the beginning was anti-corruption because he saw corruption was out of control. Another thing was to continue and to in, increase a more robust foreign policy, asserting China's control over the South China Sea, et cetera, et cetera. And another one, I would say his other main domestic policy has been the control of history. So who was he worried about? This, is, this was, again, these counter-historians starting in the late 1990s. Why the late 1990s? There have been people interested in history throughout the history of the People's Republic of China. There have been people who have challenged it in the past, intellectuals who've written about it and talked about it. But I would argue that something happened in the late 1990s that changed the game a little bit for the CCP, and that was the arrival of basic digital technologies. Not social media, not Weibo or Weixin or things like that, but rather things that we take completely for granted nowadays, like PDFs. PDFs allow you to publish on your laptop and email your publication to somebody else. You don't have to, in the old, if you think of in the past, if you wanted to circulate some idea you had, maybe you'd type it out, you'd print it out, you'd have to photocopy it and hand it out to people. Or e even earlier in the Soviet era, you'd have to make a Samizdat publication, which was typed on paper and then maybe carbon paper and another piece of paper or a mimeograph machine or something like that. And you'd have to then hand it out like that. PDFs allows you just to email. You can email to a lot of people. Obviously, if you email it to 10,000 people, uh, the Public Security Bureau is gonna quickly hone in on you. But if you do it quietly, it's possible to spread information that way. The other thing which is really important, and maybe it's especially uh, apt to talk about it in Los Angeles, the land of Hollywood, but it's the 
It's the introduction of cheap digital cameras. So in the past, say 30, 40 years ago, if you wanted to make a documentary film, you needed very expensive equipment. You had to get film developed, you had to have cutting machines, it was incredibly labor intensive and capital intensive. And in China, especially at that time, the only people who had equipment like that were by and large state-run movie uh, production companies or, or television stations. But with digital cameras, um, forget your iPhone, but even just a small camera like this, you can take really high quality um, film, you can cut it on your laptop, you can make it as, it may not be necessarily a good film, right? But it's at least you can make a film and you can then send it to other people uh, either by email or with a file sharing thing or simply with a USB stick, a memory stick. Say, here's a film I made, take a look at it. And other people begin to pass these things around. This is the magazine from which my book gets its title called Spark, Xinghua. It comes from an idiomatic expression in Chinese called a single spark can start a prairie fire. Some people often ask me, was it named after Lenin's first magazine in Russian called Spark, but it's not. It was very clearly, it, this was written by students in 1960 who were put in, who were banished to Western China during this political campaign. They saw firsthand the Great Famine. And they thought that if only senior leaders knew what was going on, uh, they would come and solve the problem. Somebody sent a letter to Beijing, to some contacts they had in Beijing. A month later, the um, army came and arrested the guy. So they knew that wasn't going to work. So they thought, okay, now we're going to start instead of a magazine, a journal. We're going to write an analysis, analyses of why the famine is taking place and send it out to different party branches around China because they were students from all different parts of China. Some are from Xi'an, some are from Guangzhou, some are from Shanghai. We'll just send it out to the country and try to get people awake to what's going on. This horrible famine killing millions and millions of people. They saw cannibalism. They saw the most horrible things imaginable. And so they wrote these essays which um, get to, the, that are incredibly prescient about the problems of single party rule. Don't forget, this is just a little over a decade after the CCP has taken power. They already noted that one of the problems was that farmers no longer own their land. The land had been all um, nationalized by the state. They noticed there was no freedom of expression, uh, that leaders could pass policy on a whim, et cetera, et cetera. They wrote these essays, they published it they got a hold of a mimeograph machine. These are some of the people involved in it. The uh, famous poet uh, Lin Zhao. Uh, this is Zhang Shunyan, uh, one of the founders. And this is Zhang Shunyan after he was arrested and just before he was executed. So there were 43 people who were arrested. Three were executed. And the rest were given long, long sentences to labor camps. And that might have been the end of it. The party confiscated all issues of the journal. Um, and and it, there were never thousands of copies. It was just a few dozen, a few score, maybe about 100 of each that were published. And it would have just died, except after the Cultural Revolution ended, some people could look in their personnel file. And in their person, one of the people who founded it, found who could look in their personnel file was his girlfriend from back then. And she looked in her personnel file, and there was everything. As in good bureaucratic fashion in a bureaucratic state, everything had been kept. Nobody wanted to get rid of the counter-revolutionary evidence. So all the issues of the journal were there, all the confessions of all the students, all the police files, even the love letters that she'd written uh, to her boyfriend were in the files. And these sat in her apartment in Shanghai for a little while in the 1980s until PDFs came along in the late 1990s. And some of her friends said, well, wait a minute, you've got photos of this. We can just put this together in a PDF and we can remake the journal. We can reconstitute Spark. And we can also put all this other stuff in there. And they began to circulate this in a slow fashion. Not, they didn't have a big website and they weren't, um, it wasn't some grand f sort of straw fire type thing, but it was a slow burn spreading so that um, the, well-known critic in Beijing and the translator of Vaclav Havel, Cui Weiping, when she saw this in about 1999, she was shocked and she said, now we have our genealogy. Now we have our lineage. We know who the people were who went on before us. And this is what began to happen in the 1990s. It wasn't just that you could write something in 1999 or 2000 and send it to other people. You could dredge up this other stuff, that had some, which was extant at least, and you could begin to circulate it. You could circulate the essays of Yulo Ke, 
the student who in the, at the end of the Cultural Revolution wrote about the privileged position of Communist Party members and their families. You could do all these kinds of things and, and, and show that you, you're not the first person to think about this, that there have been other people, and you're part of a tradition, a lineage, not just going back to Sima Qian or somebody from the ancient past, but somebody in the recent past, somebody just like you, maybe of your so, same age, who, have, who is inspired to make a change. And I think that's why I call this book Sparks, because it's about people who are active today, and there's not just, I think, one, but there's more and more of these people, despite the crackdowns that we all know of the Xi Jinping era. Um, the, yeah, I think the, that, that's one thing I want to just emphasize, that the people I write about, I began working on this in about 2012, 2013, while I was living in China. I had stopped, I'd quit my day job as a, as a correspondent for the newspaper. I was still based in China. I still had a journalist visa, but I stayed for 10 years as a freelancer. And that gave me a lot of time, especially you know, when you're unemployed, you have a lot of time on your hands. So I could, I could follow these people around <laughs> and spend a lot of time with them over the years. And I saw their space for action diminish. I saw their, the independent film festivals where you might show some of these films be eliminated, but I saw how they persisted and kept working. One of the journals that I write about in the book called Remembrance, it's now on its 345th issue. It was first published in 2008 and people are still doing it today. And I think one of the interesting things that's a bit different that's changed over the past, it seems to me, but I'm interested in other people's views, it seems to me in the past few years, there's much more interplay between people overseas and inside China, outside China and inside China. This journal, for example, is written primarily by people inside China, but they get back-end support by grad students in the United States who help edit it, lay it out, and then email it back into China from safer email addresses that aren't as likely to be uh, watched and monitored. So this kind, of, um, this kind of interplay is something kind of new. It used to be in the past, exile communities tended to be quite isolated or cut off from events in China. But it seems to me now, um, especially the COVID protests of last year, which I have a section on in the book, were an example of how people inside and outside China were cooperating a little bit. There were videos and so on that were made inside China that were being uploaded to Twitter or to um, YouTube, and then sometimes downloaded again back into China. So they were using these social media sites as a marshalling yard to keep things maybe safe in case you're worried that your phone was going to be snatched and then they could um, repurpose it back in China for other uses. Um, is there time for me to give a reading, do you think? Or should we? That'd yeah. Perfect. OK, I'll give a short reading. I've been giving you a lot of ideas and things like that, but I wanted to sort of introduce you to some of the people who are involved. And the person I want to talk about, his name is Tan Ho Chung. Tan Ho Chung was a journalist, writer, essayist, who in 1984, 1985, was part of a team that was sent to southern, uh, the southern part of Hunan province. At, Hunan province was the site of a massacre in the Cultural Revolution when party officials killed everybody who was considered a black element. And that meant anybody who had been, who was a, either a landlord or even the child of a landlord, the offspring of a nationalist party official, etc. They were all massacred, 9,000 people. And at that time, the party's reformist leader, Hu Yaobang, sent an investigation team to Hunan province to find out what happened. He sent 1,200 officials. And as a member of the state media, Tan was part of that. He was part of the team. He wasn't um, anything unusual, people talked to him openly because he was part of the system, right? He was uh, part of the state system. Um, and he got access to tens of thousands of pages of documents. And then he told me, when the first round of interviews was over, the political atmosphere was already darkening. Forces in the party opposed what was called bourgeois liberalization. So my article couldn't be published. And the more time went on, the more impossible it became. It got tighter and tighter. The smart thing to do would have been to drop the project. Tan had a family and needed to think of them too. But Dow County wouldn't let him rest. 
It was meant to portray the massacre, uh, he was meant to portray the massacre there as a mistake, as a few bad apples who let things get out of control, which is the way the party usually explains its mistakes. If he had been allowed to publish some of his findings, maybe this is what he would have written. But now that he couldn't publish anything, he was freed of this need to compromise and was faced with a stark choice, drop it or pursue it fully. He chose the latter because of one horrible realization. Not one of the roughly 9,000 people killed had been planning a counter-revolutionary event. It wasn't that some had been killed unjustly, all of them had. He told me, when I understood this, I was heartbroken. I began to realize that the party had a history of violence. Already in 1928, it organized violent peasant revolts that killed masses of people. And land reform was incredibly violent. All of a sudden, it became clear. There was no justification for what had happened. It was just terror. That was when Tan felt his calling. He thought of the survivors, the family members, and the reform-minded officials who had given him information. He had pledged to them that he wasn't doing this for personal gain, but for their, for all Chinese people's descendants, so that this kind of state-led violence would not happen again. He went back to his editors. They were nice people. One suggested he wait 20 or 30 years. Maybe around 2000 or 2010, it would be possible to publish it, he told Tan, never imagining that things would be even tougher later on. Tan thanked him, but disagreed. Word began to get around that he was traveling down to Dow County on his own to do follow-up interviews. By then, Tan had been identified as a troublemaker. He wasn't fired, but was marginalized. Promotions, conferences, and prizes never came his way, but he didn't care. And I have to warn you, this is like um, swear word warning. This person is rather foul mouthed. There'll be a certain amount of swearing and, and uh, expletive deleted. <laughs> it's, it's not already. Um, you know, he said, I can kiss ass as well as anyone. I'm really good at it. In fact, I'm an excellent ass kisser. And here in Chinese, it's pai ma pi. I can tell people what they want to hear. And I can write an article any way you want it. I, but I have a minimum moral standard. I can't turn black into white. Somehow, I just can't do that. So when they said they wouldn't publish it, I thought, OK, that's your problem. But my life had changed. And so I thought, this is it. One way or another, I will publish this. When I traveled around Dow County with Tan, I went with him uh, for a, a couple of times in the 2010s, it was like being on a slightly manic roller coaster. And let me just show a picture of him. I had him up here earlier. A boisterous man with soft features, an unruly cowlick, and an irrepressible gallows humor, Tan was constantly erupting with facts, figures, curses, and comments about places and people. When we drove by a village, he might begin to recount the detail of who was bludgeoned or shot, but then cut himself short by shouting out, fuck, this place killed a lot of people. In spite of ourselves, we would start laughing and then decide, should we pass by this scene of a massacre, or should we stop? Because there were so many, we often drove by. But on a few places, Tan insisted that we stop. And this is the place. One of those places was Widow's Bridge. In, eight, in the 18th century, a wealthy widow decided to help people by donating money for the bridge over the Fushu River. We arrived at dusk one early winter's day, the bridge peaceful and quiet, with stands of camphor trees and willows along the banks. Tan had had a similarly peaceful feeling when he arrived here in 1986. But then he was shown marks in the balustrade where sabers had bit into the stone after chopping off the victims' heads. As he recounts in his book, rubbing the knife marks made everything around recede into a blur. This shouldn't have been the place where people died. I couldn't keep tears from flowing down my face. His tears were also shed for one of the most notable victims executed here. He Pinger was a local teacher whose family had owned a small amount of land before the communist takeover. The family's land holdings had been absurdly small, less than half an acre with no hired labor and no land rented out. But Mao had man mandated that every county have landlords. 
And so people like the teacher's family were declared members of the exploitive landowning class. But this wasn't the only reason that Tan cried at the bridge. I, the teacher had spent two decades trying to toe the line, writing obsequious paeans to the Communist Party rule, and going to his death shouting out his fealty to Chairman Mao. China's literati, Tan wrote, have always aspired to self-improvement and to guiding the country toward peace and prosperity. But ultimately, they've never been anything more than subjects, commoners, and slaves. Now, 30 years after his first visit, we stood there on the bridge, talking to one of Teacher He's descendants, Zhou Shenliang. He was born three years after the killings and had mixed feelings about discussing the events. His side of the family is related to Zhou Duni, an 11th century Neo-Confucian philosopher who achieved enlightenment while fishing in one of the local rivers. Zhou met us at the bridge because Tan wanted to go over some facts about the killing that day. Tan asked him about his grandmother's pension. Because Zhou's grandfather was never reckoned to have been unjustly killed, the grandmother never got a typical, a proper pension. This is typical for most of the victims who often received small payments and no recognition of what had happened. Zhou is a pudgy 40-year-old who runs a computer store in the county seat. The government appointed him to a commission to commemorate the 1,000th anniversary of Zhou Duni's birth. He answered all of Tan's questions politely, but seemed ambivalent. I asked him if he felt uncomfortable talking about his family's suffering. It's not just that it's an unfortunate issue, he said. It's that the party hasn't come to a clear decision on the issue. It's still very sensitive. I understood Mr. Joe's dilemma. Of course, he wanted to clarify the events, but he also wanted to live a life. He had ambitions. He had a family. It wasn't as simple as the usual cliches one sometimes hears, such as life must go on or people should forget the past. He had to deal with the reality that the same party was still in power. They appointed him to the commission. They issued business licenses. They could decide if your child went to university. As we talked, Tan stood off to the side, beginning a monologue. After having spent a few days with him, I had come to expect these outbursts, which usually occurred when he was extremely agitated. They were a kind of therapy. He would wind himself into a near frenzy, talking about how the party had killed so many people, but also about how China's educated class was partly responsible because it went along with the system. When writing, he used very measured language, but out here on the bridge, he couldn't contain himself. Intellectuals were cowardly. They didn't stand up. They deserved it. The teacher had written a play lauding the party and still had been persecuted. He said, he wrote an ass-kissing script but was still killed, he said with a laugh. He didn't believe any of what he wrote, but he still kissed the party's ass. And even so, they killed him. Ha! Joe stood to me looking glum. To him, Tan was a marvel and a mystery. Joe's family had suffered, and Tan could explain it all so clearly. He had the facts and figures. He had documents. He had written it down and published it abroad. But Joe was also concerned that Tan could be arrested. This drive, this passion, it's not normal, he thought. It's not what the system encourages. But Joe respected it. It moved him. And so he listened, and then after a while, he put his hand on Tan's shoulder. And using an honorific as a sign of genuine respect, he said, thank you, Teacher Tan. Coming out here isn't easy. We appreciate it. Our ancestors appreciate it. Our future generations will appreciate this too. Tan stops talking, his eyes wet with tears. He turned to the water and stared at it with incomprehension. 30 years after coming here, he still couldn't understand what had happened. So with that, I'll stop and...